uh, every week the staff places an, an ornament, a Christmas tree ornament, up on my table here. And like you, uh, I have no idea what's in this box. And so I don't want you to think that we have all of this planned. I have no idea what's in this box. My job, they kind of give me the idea, my job is to open up, see the ornament, and sometime, somehow extemporaneously apply it to the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. So uh, I hope it's uh, nothing that would embarrass me or nothing that would embarrass you. I'm sure it's not. But uh, all right, our Christmas ornament today. What a beautiful ornament is the manger scene. Isn't that beautiful today? And so uh, during this time of year, we absolutely are, are talking about Jesus and uh, his coming and his spending time there, uh, spending time here upon the earth, and it all began there in the manger. And that's what actually brings joy to each and every one of us. And the uh, Christmas carol that we're studying today very simply is this, joy to the world, as our beautiful choir sang just a few moments ago. Let me ask you a question, though, this morning. Is Christmas a joyful time for you? Uh, it certainly is portrayed as the most wonderful, as the most joyous, as the most jolly, as the most cheerful, and as the most festive time of the year. Just listen to some of the song titles that I'm sure you're listening to there that, that are on the radio. It's a wonderful Christmas time. It's a holly jolly Christmas. Some of us can probably sing that. Merry, Merry Christmas, baby. I can't sing that one. Maybe I should. I don't think I know that one. Merry, Merry Christmas, baby. Have yourself a merry little Christmas and one that all of us know, happy holidays, happy holidays. Yes, many people say that Christmas is the most joyful time of the year. Quite frankly, though, if you're like me, I go to the mall and I just don't feel it. Are you with me on that? I mean, I go to the mall and everybody's supposed to be happy, but uh, I don't get this happy vibe when I go through the mall. The other day, Vicki and I were at the mall and we were making some Christmas presents or, or purchasing some Christmas presents and we were pulling in the mall and, you know, it's always difficult for us to find a disabled spot with Amber. So this disabled spot opened up and so I did this really quick, sharp U-turn and had to back up and while I was backing up, I almost hit this lady and can you believe she got mad? mad at me right there in front of everybody. I mean, I almost hit her and she had the audacity to get mad at me. Actually, it was my fault and uh, she had every right to. But if you're like me, you go through the mall and at times people don't express the happiness and the joy. At times they seem grumpy, they seem frustrated, they seem upset, fighting for parking spots and trying to get that perfect gift. Uh, this time of year, which is supposed to produce joy and satisfaction, often results in anger and, sadly, in frustration. For many others, though, Christmas is a time of pain. It's a time of loneliness. It's a time of depression. Uh, whatever our situation is today, how can you and I, this Christmas, experience real joy? How can we experience real happiness? And all of us are going to be experiencing a variety of different circumstances and situations this Christmas. Some of you are really excited because your kids and family are coming in and you're looking forward to that. And others of you have a lot of hesitation because your kids and your families are coming in and, and you don't know how to uh, deal with all of that. But no matter what our situation this year, how can we be guaranteed of the fact that we will experience a joyous, happy, satisfying Christmas? Well, the answer is found in the first line of the Christmas carol that we're studying today. Because as the group sang, and you know the words, the song goes like this, joy to the world, what does it say? The Lord is it doesn't say joy to the world because there are a lot of presents under the tree. It doesn't say joy to the world because my family is coming in. It doesn't say joy to the world because I'm not going to be alone. It doesn't say joy to the world because my in-laws are not coming in this year. All right, That's not what the song says. The song says joy to the world, the Lord is come. You see, real joy long-lasting joy 
Christmas joy comes in the realization that the Christ of Christmas has come to earth. And so in a very real sense, it doesn't matter what we're going through, what we need to experience or what we will experience this Christmas, whether it involves stress or whether it involves no stress, whatever we're going through, you and I can be assured of the fact that God desires for us to have and experience joy because the Lord has come. As I mentioned, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 98. We're going to read this entire psalm, and the, this might not seem like a normal passage that we would study during the Christmas season, and we'll explain why we're studying it in just a moment. Psalm 98, I'm going to read the entire psalm. Psalm 98, beginning in verse 1. David the psalmist says this, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre and with the, with the lyre. That's L-Y-R-E, not L-I-A-R. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Make a joyful noise to the Lord with the lyre. That's an instrument and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar. And all that fills it, the world and all those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to worship you. And Father, we all get that this is a busy time of year. All of us are, are going to parties, whether they're family parties or work parties or friends parties, and we're running around trying to get our shopping done and trying to get our houses decorated and planning on either traveling or receiving family. Father, this is a busy time of year. But Father, I pray that you'd help us not to be so busy that we would demote you during this season. Help us to realize in a very real sense that this season is not about us. The season is about you. And when we really make it about you, we make it about what it is supposed to be about. Father, that's when we can experience real joy, true joy, long-lasting joy. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand this passage of Scripture, the song, the hymn, the carol that we're studying today. And Lord, may not only the world experience your joy, but may we individually experience your joy as well. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I took a survey today, I'm not going to do it, but if I took a survey and I asked you today, what is your favorite Christmas carol? I know we'd get a variety of answers, but I am confident that at least some of us, a large group or a small group, some of us would sit back and say, why my favorite Christmas carol is joy to the world. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because whenever we take requests in some of our groups and we say, what Christmas carol do you want to sing? One of the very first that is often mentioned is joy to the world. World. It's become one of the most popular Christmas carols. Whether you realize it or not, Joy to the World was written many years ago. It was written by a gentleman by the name of Isaac Watts, and it was written in 1719. And it was written as a hymn based on Psalm 98, the passage of scripture that we read that we're studying today. Now this may surprise you. But Joy to the World was originally written not as a Christmas carol. Isaac Watts didn't write it sitting down saying, you know what, I want to I write a great Christmas song. What can I write? Why? Joy. Let's write Joy to the World. It wasn't written as a Christmas carol. 
Rather, it was a, written as a hymn celebrating Jesus' second coming to earth. Isaac Watts, in other words, wasn't thinking about Christ's first coming when he penned the words to the song. Rather, he was thinking about his second coming. He wasn't writing about Christ's incarnation. Uh, rather, he was writing a song to celebrate Jesus' future coronation. Now, now, let's not let that discourage us. You might walk away saying, why, I'm never going to sing that song at Christmas again. Well, regardless of, of the time of year, regardless of the timing, the mere thought of Christ's coming to earth should cause every believer to sing out, to shout out in praise. Okay, one person said amen with that. Thank you so much for that. All right, let me say that again. Just the mere thought that God left heaven and came to earth, became one of us, took on flesh and came to earth, should cause every one of us to shout out in praise. Amen. Oh, there you go. Boy, just a little coaching. It's amazing how, how good you guys do. That was certainly the case with Mary the mother of Jesus. Many believe, there's, there's no way we can prove it, but many believe that Mary was meditating on this psalm. When she traveled to Jerusalem, and when she wrote her song of triumph, her song of praise in Luke 1, verses 46 through 55. I'm sure you're familiar with that song that she wrote, that song of triumph and praise, realizing that she would be the mother of the Messiah. And she sat down and wrote this beautiful song and penned these beautiful words. As a matter of fact, when you place Psalm 98 side by side with the song that Mary wrote in Luke chapter 1, you see remarkable parallels. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. I'll put them up on the screen. You don't have to look at both passages. But in Psalm 98 in verse 1, David says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Mary responds in Luke 1, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Psalm 98 in verse 1, his right hand has won a mighty victory. Mary says in Luke 1, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Psalm 98 in verse 1, his holy arm has shown his saving power. Luke 1 51, he has shown strength with his arm. And though Isaac Watts maybe wasn't thinking of the incarnation when he wrote Joy to the World. Many believe that Mary was thinking of Psalm 98 when she realized that she was carrying the Son of God in her womb. And when she wrote that great song, her Magnificat, Mary's triumphal song of victory. And so Psalm 98 is important for us even during the Christmas season. And it's important for that great carol, Joy to the World. As I mentioned, Joy to the World is a favorite. As late as the 20th century, Joy to the World was the most published Christmas hymn in all of North America. And so it's significant what we're studying today. Now, as I mentioned, digging back into Psalm 98, many believe and we are confident that Psalm 98 is a messianic, Psalm. By that we mean it's messianic in purpose. It speaks of none other than Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We agree with Isaac Watts that the coming of the Lord brings joy. So the question this morning is this, how does Jesus' coming bring us joy? How do his life, his ministry, and his death trump the trials, tribulations, and tough experiences of our life. Listen, I, I realize that today I'm speaking to a congregation that's going through all kinds of different trials, and you might be sitting out there today saying, Brian, you have no idea what I'm going through. 
Brian, if you were experiencing what I'm experiencing, if you were going through what I'm going through, there's no way that you would or could experience joy. And yet I'm confident that the truth of this song, the truth of joy to the world, pervades not only the good times of our life, but is applicable during the difficult moments of our life as well. And so as we walk through the psalm, we see three simple points about Jesus Christ. We see the gospel beautifully portrayed and illustrated in this psalm. Notice the first thing we see is this. We see that Jesus came to redeem. Jesus came to redeem. Many people get confused as to why Jesus came to the earth. Uh, He didn't make the leap from heaven to earth just to teach us how to live. Jesus didn't make that huge um, leap from heaven to earth just so we could get along with one another or even to guide us through the, the, the political and the societal struggles of our life. That's not why Jesus came to earth. Now, he does all of those things, but his ultimate purpose very simply is this. Jesus came to redeem us. Jesus said it this way in Luke 19 and verse 10. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. And so both Psalm 98 and Christmas are both about redemption. It is about God seeing our sinful plight and sending Jesus to to rescue us. Now when we realize that truth, How should you and I respond to that? That's what the psalmist is talking about here in Psalm 98. Notice several things as we follow your outline. The first is this. Jesus' coming gives us a new song. His coming gives us a new song. Notice verse 1 once again of Psalm 98. He says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Here's just a couple of thoughts practical things that that I'm sure you understand, but let me just highlight this morning. The first is this, God wants his people to sing. Let me say that again. God wants his people to sing. Did you know that there are more than 30 verses in the Bible that specifically exhort and even command Christians to sing? Let me show you some. Exodus 15, 21, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. First Chronicles 16, 9, sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all of his wonders. Isaiah 12, 5, praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. James 5, 13, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. We've taught on that passage of scripture before, and we've taught that you actually could invert those truths. You could actually say, is anyone among you suffering? He is to sing praises. Is anyone cheerful? Then he must pray, because at every moment, in every situation in our life, we're we're exhorted both to pray and to praise at the exact same time. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, because... I think that way too. You're sitting back saying, well, Brian, you don't get it. I know there's some people that are really musically inclined. And there's some people that that just love listening to music and they love singing all the time. I'm just not one of those people. I get that. I'm, I'm not one of those people. I'm a guy that I can go all day long and not listen to any music whatsoever and I'm satisfied with that. Anybody else in the congregation that are the exact same way? All right, three of you. Man, I mean, I am an oddball. There's no doubt about that. All right, now my wife is the exact opposite of that. Vicky's got to have music playing literally all the time. She's either playing music on the radio or she's playing music on the piano or she's singing music. I mean, she is musically inclined, and some of you are that way. So you're sitting back. You might sit back and say, Brian, listen, I, I, I just, I'm not a musical person. Others of you might sit back and say, hey, Brian, you know what? I love listening to music. I've just got a really bad voice. Let me just ask this. 
Are you sitting beside somebody today who has a really bad voice? Anybody, anybody, nobody wants to admit that today. You might sit back and say, listen, man, I would love to sing. I just don't do it well. Well, listen, here's what the psalmist is saying, and here's something that we find repeated throughout Scripture. Our, our lack of desire to hear music or even our lack of talent to sing is not an excuse for not using your voice to worship the Lord. God wants you to sing. I love the words I found this quote of John Wesley. John Wesley was the founder of Methodism, and, and, and John Wesley made this quote. I'll put it up. He said, sing lustily and with good courage. John Wesley actually had different rules in church, and he had a rules for worship. I think this was rule number five. He told his congregation, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, no more ashamed of its being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. In other words, he says, hey, you know what? Before you became a believer, you weren't ashamed to sing. I mean, you, you, you drove down the road with the windows down and the radio blaring, and you were singing as loud as you could be, all right? Why don't you use the same enthusiasm? Why don't you use your voice today to worship the Lord? God desires for all of us to sing. Here's the second truth that I wrote down that's in your notes. Man's highest purpose is to praise the Lord. Catch that today. Man's highest purpose is to praise the Lord. Listen, you were not created to build a family. You were not created to work a job or to make money. Now, God allows us to do all of those things. But you and I were created for the purpose of praising the Lord. That's why he created us. I love the way that the book of Psalms ends, 150 Psalms. The last verse of Psalms, Psalm 150 in verse 6, says this. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The psalm is really interesting. He talks about this group praising and this group praising. And just in case somebody's sitting back saying, well, you know what? I'm not in any of those groups. He said, you know what? If you have breath, praise the Lord. And I venture to say that all of us have breath this morning. I don't see anybody blue in the face. If we have breath, we've been what? We've been created to praise him. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks the question, what is the chief end of man? And the response is this. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. John Piper's made the great quote that missions exists because worship doesn't. And God desires for every person, every family, every country, every people to worship him. And the idea is that when we get to know him and we understand him, it propels us to do what? It propels us to worship him. God not only wants us to sing, here we're exhorted to sing a new song. Notice the verse once again, he says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. This is the third time in the book of Psalms that the psalmist encourages us to sing a new song. Psalm 33 and verse 3, sing to him a new song. Song. Psalm 96 and verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song. And here in Psalm 98 and verse 1, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. What does that mean? Well, a new song signifies that there is something uncommon, something unexpected, something out of the ordinary for which man should praise if you read commentaries on this, man, everybody comes to all kinds of different com conclusions. Some say that there was the old song of the physical creation. Now there is a new song about becoming a spiritual creation in Jesus Christ. Others say, man, there was an old song uh, about redemption and bondage from Egypt, speaking specifically of the nation of Israel, while the new song is our redemption and bondage from sin. Some would say that the old song is about the law, but the new song 
is about grace. David doesn't tell us what the content of the new song is. He just says this, sing to the Lord a new song. Listen, here's what I want you to catch today. The truth is that redemption results in rejoicing. Let me say it again. Redemption results in rejoicing. If we're not rejoicing over our redemption, we do not understand the magnitude of everything that God has done for us. Man, we rejoice over a variety of things. Bob was walking in today. I was standing out front, and Bob's walking in, and all of a sudden I hear him going, Woohoo! And he holds up, I think it was a five dollar, was it a five dollar bill? Holds up a five dollar bill, said, Brian, I just found this in the parking lot today. All right, now I don't want anybody to run out there. I'm not going to tell you what part of the parking lot it was, but man, he was all excited about that. He was rejoicing in the fact that he had found five bucks, and you probably would have too. We have a tendency to rejoice over such worldly, trivial things. And yet the most important thing in life does not move us. It doesn't cause us to stand up on our feet and yell and scream and rejoice over what God has done for us. Redemption results in rejoicing. Understanding who God is and what he has done for us should put a song in our hearts. And so his coming, his coming motivates us to sing. There's a second thing that that David says in the passage. His coming demonstrates his strength. Notice verse 1 once again. He says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Uh, John Phillips, the great commentator, said this. He said, Observe God's right hand, and behind that hand, his holy arm. And behind that holy arm stands all of the resources and the resolve of absolute deity. The phrase right hand in ancient times had the idea of strength. It had the idea of power. And so David is talking about God's strength. He's talking about, he's talking about God's power. Undoubtedly, since the beginning of time, God's power and might have been demonstrated in the lives of his people. Man, we could talk uh, for the rest of the morning about all the great acts that God did on behalf of his people. He parted the waters of the Red Sea so that the Israelites could walk across on dry land, his strong arm. He miraculously provided food for the Israelites every day during their 40-year exile in the desert, his strong arm. He caused the walls of Jericho to fall flat, his strong arm. He incredibly defeated the Assyrian army that was led by Sennacherib, his strong arm. The psalmist says, hey, God's arm is strong. It demonstrates the strength of God. Let me pause for a second and ask you this question. What has God done in your life? And sometimes I think we're, we're so busy and we have such a structured service that it would be great sometimes just to pause and allow us to give testimony as to everything that God is doing in my life and in yours because I guarantee you that the strength of God is seen in your life on a regular basis. Sadly, we have blinders on and we fail to realize it. God works strongly on behalf of his people. Yes, God has done marvelous things, but his greatest exhibition of strength was accomplished through the coming of Jesus Christ. Of all the things that God has done, his greatest demonstration of strength and power and might was in the coming of Jesus Christ. That is what joy to the world is all about. Joy to the world. The Lord is How is that? The third thing that I wrote is this. His coming results in our salvation. 
He says this way in verse 1, his right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Verse 2, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. The most wonderful, the most awesome, the most astonishing display of God's power is providing salvation for us who cannot earn it and could never, ever deserve it. And if we could ever wrap our mind and our heart around that, God gives us something that we could never, ever, ever deserve. If you lived a thousand years, if you lived a million years, and you dedicated all of your time and all of your talents and all of your resources to the work of God, you could never, ever deserve the gift that God has given to you freely through His grace. And yet, man, we, we have a tendency to get over that and we take that for granted in our lives. That's what Isaac Watts is writing about. He says two things about God's salvation. He says this, first of all, his salvation was known. Notice in verse 2, he says, the Lord has made known his salvation. God didn't hide it from us. He revealed it to us. His salvation was known. And then the second thing, just to rhyme, was his salvation was shown. It not only was known, but his salvation was shown as well. Verse 2 says this, he has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. God's holiness, his righteousness, his compassion, and desire to save are all perfectly known and seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the visible representation of God. It's God coming to us, becoming one of us, so that we could, in a very real sense, understand who God is. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. And it's so important for us to understand that because we live in a day and age in which, uh, you know, that's not a, a, uh, a, a statement that is politically correct. But, but let me say that again because it's so very important. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. There's not five roads that lead to heaven. There's not four roads that lead to heaven. There's not three roads that lead to heaven. There's not two. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Our response to that should be to break out in song. Notice verse 4, the psalmist says this, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and praises. Why is that? Because we understand who God is and what God has done for us. Jesus came to redeem. Let me show you a second thing. Jesus not only came to redeem, but Jesus came to restore in verses 7 and 8, the psalmist speaks of the sea roaring. He talks about the rivers clapping. He talks about the hills singing. In this psalm, we see nature praising. We see creation singing. Now you sit back and say, okay, Brian, what is that just, is that just the psalmist taking poetic license and talking about, okay, the hills are going to clap and the rivers are going to roar and we understand all of that. Well, Isaac Watts got it. As a matter of fact, if you remember his song, Joy to the World, the Lord has come, he ends that, that, that first verse with this phrase over and over again, let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. What is the idea? That one day, heaven and nature, just as we cry out and worship God, one day, heaven and nature will equally cry out and worship you see here the psalmist and Isaac Watts both were prophesying of the day in which the earth would no longer be under the bondage of sin. Let me give you two truths that are in your outline. This is, this is deep theological stuff today, so, so catch this. The first is this, 
because of Adam's sin, all of creation was put under a curse. Because of Adam's sin, all of creation was put under a curse. Remember there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17, when the Lord was declaring the, uh, the results of all of that, he made this statement. He said, cursed is the ground because of you. I love the statement of Charles Spurgeon. He said this, the slime of Adam's sin covers the entire planet. And it does. Uh, you and I are, are living in the slime of Adam's sin and the slime of your sin and mine. Nothing is free from the stain of man's sinfulness. Even creation itself groans under the strain of God's curse. The evidence is undeniable. We live among a fallen people on a fallen planet. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 8.20, for the creation was subjected to futility. Romans 8.22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. But this prophecy, this psalm that David writes about, the song that Isaac Watts wrote, speak of the day when that curse will be lifted and all of creation will be restored. You say, Brian, how is that possible? The second point in your notes is this. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, all of creation will be restored. You see, because of Adam's sin, everybody, you and I, the entire world was placed under a curse. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, one day that curse will be lifted. It's lifted in your life and mine whenever by faith we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And it will be lifted on this planet as well one day when Jesus comes to reign. Verse 3 of Joy to the World says this, No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse be found. You see, because of Jesus' victory over sin and death, one day everything will be restored. You see, when Jesus returns, God will hit the reset button and creation will be set free from its bondage. Everything has been marred. Everything has been tainted by sin. But one day, when Jesus hits that reset button, everything that has been marred, everything that has been tainted will be returned to its original condition. It will be refined. It will be reset to just the way that God intended for it to be. You think the earth is beautiful now? You ain't seen nothing yet. Because of Jesus Christ, one day the earth will be completely restored. John says it this way in John 21 and verse 5. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Isaac Watts got it. He said Jesus not only came to redeem, but Jesus also came to restore. He came to restore our own lives and he came to restore creation as well. Let me give you a final third point in the psalm. The psalmist says this, Jesus also came to reign. He not only came to redeem, he not only came to restore, but he also came to reign. Notice verse 9, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and he will judge the peoples with equity. Two things. Let me give it to you quickly. Two things. The Lord, when he comes, will rule faithfully. The Lord will rule faithfully. Righteousness is the idea of always doing what is right. Think of having, think with me of having a king who never makes a mistake. Think of having a ruler who always does what is right all the time 
That's what the psalmist says. When Jesus comes, he will rule with righteousness. He will rule with integrity. Um, we've all smiled at the story of Solomon. You know the story of Solomon? You know, you know the two ladies came to him and they were arguing over the one child. Remember they both had delivered children and one had died during the night and so the one whose child had died took her dead baby and placed it in the crib of the live baby and took the live baby and now both mothers were fighting over the same child and, and they come to Solomon and say Solomon because Solomon was known for all of his wisdom and they come to Solomon and say Solomon help us this is my baby and the other lady says no it's not your baby it's my baby judge and Solomon in all of his wisdom you know the the story says, give me a sword. And they bring him a sword, and Solomon says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut the baby in two. And so he says, place the baby on the table, and he raises the sword as if to slice the baby in two. And the real mother cries out, no, Solomon, spare my child. Give it to her. And Solomon realizes who the real mother is. What a demonstration of wisdom. And yet Jesus said when he was alive, Jesus said, Someone greater than Solomon is here. Someone wiser than Solomon is here. You see, when Jesus finally reigns, he will make the wisdom of Solomon look like that of a toddler. Jesus will rule faithfully. But the second thing, the Lord will not only rule faithfully, he will also rule fairly. He'll rule fairly. The text says this, he will judge the people with equity. He will judge the people with equity. He'll rule fairly. I'm a, um, you don't have to be around me long to know that I'm an absolute college football fanatic. Um, yesterday was a tough day for me because it was the first day in which there weren't any college football games. And so I'm a little bit in withdrawal right now. And uh, if you're around me long, you realize that I'm not only a college football fanatic, but I am an Ohio State Buckeye fanatic, all right? Nobody throw anything at me. I was born in Ohio, and uh, all year long, we've had a difficult season, and our, our starting quarterback went down, then our second string quarterback went down, and then our third string quarterback went down, and we still won the Big Ten Championship. And if you know anything, last Sunday afternoon, they decided who were going to be the four teams in the first ever playoff. And those of us that are Ohio State Buckeyes fan, we spent all day Saturday fasting and praying and... <laughs> And, uh, and sure enough, on Sunday afternoon, it came out, and one of the four teams was none other than Ohio State. And so it just, just, just illustrated for us again that God's still on the throne, right decisions are made all the time. I say all of that joking because there's a lot of people that are saying, hold on, that's not fair. They don't deserve to be in there. That is not a fair. That's not an equitable decision. There's other schools that should be there. We can debate that all day long, and I get it. In this life, it's almost impossible to always come to a fair and just decision. But the day is coming in which there will be a ruler that is perfect. The day is coming in which there will be a ruler that has never sinned, that has never had a wicked thought, that has no selfish, egotistical motives. He is holy, he is righteous, he is just, and he will rule and he will reign with complete justice and with, with, complete, with complete equity. Say that hard. Who is that? It's none other than Jesus Christ. That's what Isaac Watts was writing about joy to the world. He rules the world. He rules the world with truth and grace. And today we can have joy no matter what is taking place in our lives because Jesus came to earth. So this Christmas, are you joyful? Are you happy? Are you satisfied? no matter what is taking place in your life. It doesn't matter if your Christmas activities excite you or aggravate you. It doesn't matter if you receive your desired gift or you don't receive any gift. It really doesn't matter if you're going to be with family or if you are going to be all alone. None of those things produce real joy. Isaac Watts nailed it in his very first verse, when he said this, 
joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let the earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. Here's the question. Do you have room in your heart this Christmas for Jesus? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your schedule? Is there room in your life for Jesus? Because in a very real sense, Christmas is not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. And when we make it about him, we are able to experience real joy.